wasn't always hanging out with the artist. And in some ways, I was hanging out with more people from the architecture school. Um, even though I didn't have that kind of ability or desire to sit inside of a kind of precision-based practice like that, I there were things about the way that they think and work that I appreciated. Hi, everyone. I'm Amy Devers. I'm Jamie Derringer, and this is Clever. And today we're talking to fine artist and designer, Daniel Arsham. Daniel is co-founder of the collaborative design studio, Snarkitecture, which is known for large scale projects, installations, and objects. Their conceptual approach centers on the importance of experience and invites people to explore and engage with their surroundings in unexpected and memorable ways. As a visual artist, his work spans fine art, film, and stage design, including a long-term collaboration with Merce Cunningham Dance Company. Just a quick note on audio here, we caught up with Daniel in his busy studio, so you may hear a bit of background noise. Just consider it ambiance. Okay, let's talk to Daniel. My name is Daniel Arsham. I live in New York City. I am a visual artist, I would say, as my main title, sort of crosses many different mediums and fields. And why is a longer answer, because I'm compelled to somehow. Well, we always like to kind of trace things back to the roots, to the very beginning. I understand you were born in 1980 in Cleveland, Ohio. That's right. And then spent sometime in Miami, Florida. Can you talk about your childhood for us? Like what your family was like, what kind of kid you might have been? So I was born in Cleveland, uh, but don't really remember that period. As I moved to Miami, I think when I was three or four, and primarily grew up in Miami. Kind of typical like suburban house that looks identical to all the other houses that are around. Track and home. it was like in a development, you know, so they... Yeah. They do this weird thing where they mirror the floor plan of some of the houses. I remember being in a friend's house and having like a moment of realization that I was in my house, but it was a mirror image of my house. You know, everything was backwards, it was like turned oh, around. That's kind of surreal. Um, <laughs> yeah, which is sort of sort of an interesting kind of early like uh, architectural uh, realization. I was kind of grew up in. I would say like the more natural side of things in Miami on the water out in the Everglades and um, playing sports and really kind of um, being involved a lot in photography. What sports did you play? Like skateboarding and basketball primarily. Mm -hmm. And photography. Did you have a familial reference to photography or did you pick that up on your own? My grandfather gave me, it was a Pentax K1000 for my 11th birthday. You know, I don't really come from any sort of artistically based family. My family is all, and my father's a banker, my mother's a lawyer, my grandfather was an insurance agent. It's like not the world, but (laughs) my grandfather, he was kind of the only person I knew that collected real art, you know, things that weren't multiples or, or prints. And I remember seeing things. They still continue to uh, live in Cleveland. So when I would go back there, you know, he would have like, I remember he had this amazing like Picasso vase that was probably like a multiple, you know, there may have been hundreds of them that were made, but he knew exactly the context of that, what period it was done in and kind of that early introduction, right, to a world of thinking that placed value on creation and value on uh, objects that contained an idea within them. Mm -hmm. So that camera set you on a path. I mean, it certainly like led me to thinking about making, you know, visual, visual making. I ended up going to a school that was kind of like a magnet program for photography and following that wanted to study architecture. So I went to a kind of architecture and design-based uh, high school in Miami called uh, Design and Architecture Senior High. Oh, wow. Oh. Was that in Florida? Yeah, in Miami. It's still around. So what was your experience like there? Did you get in there and you were like, oh, these are my people and this is my jam? Or 
how did you feel about it? I always had an interest in architecture and thinking about the kind of construction of space and even like evaluating space that I already lived in. You know, I can remember drawing floor plans of the house that I grew up in as a child and uh, certainly architecture was something that I wanted to pursue, um, but pretty quickly realized after taking a couple of drafting courses that the level of precision and kind of dedication to math and, you know, the, really the precision that goes into that was not something that would sit well with me over time. I gravitated more towards the art studios that we took at that school and by the time I, you know, was a senior, was much more focused heavily in painting. There was a lot of landscape painting and these kind of, you know, abstracted musical instruments and things like that. I would say it didn't have really a particular focus. Um, and I continued with the photography as well during that uh, period. And so it sounds like your parents were pretty supportive of you moving into a career in the arts, um, despite the fact that they didn't have creative careers. Yeah, I think they saw it, you know, as a way to encourage uh, an interest and a focused interest in really anything. <laughs> Whether they thought there would be a career that would come out of that, I have no idea. So after high school, you went to uh, Cooper Union in New York. So can we talk a little bit about the college years and what, what were those like for you? What did you study? Um, what was your favorite thing that you learned while you were there? So Cooper was sort of the, the highest goal that I had set of where to go from, from school. And I wasn't initially accepted. I was put on like a waiting list and found out pretty close to the you know, time that I was going to go there. So was already, you know, super excited to just be uh, among that group of people who, you know, were kind of the best of what everyone had to offer. So attended Cooper and, you know, the school is extremely small. So the classes, the entire student body per year is around 60 people. And when the classes are divided down, you're in a basically a group of 15 people that you follow sort of throughout the four years. Um, so you really get to know a lot of those people well and watch them as they're also trying to digest and understand the, the education that you're getting. And Cooper, I would say, is relatively similar in the first year to other schools where you're studying two-dimensional drawing and three-dimensional design, color theory, all of these things that you might find at any university. I think the focus was much more about thinking than it was about making, thinking about how materials and objects can be imbued with a meaning or a direction can in invoke um, ideas and feelings within other people and how to control those things, right? Focus them. And also why. I think when you're a young artist like that, you know that you want to create things, you know that you're um, interested in things, but I think the why is is always somewhat missing. Missing or just untrained, unexamined? Well, it's undefined. It's undefined, like ask, yeah. You know, if you ask a college student, like, what do you want your work to be about, you know, or what do you want your, your sort of life work to be about? There's a kind of break between all the artists that you're studying that have had long careers when you look at their work, it feels so focused and concise and there's a larger framework to it. And even if they worked in many different mediums, there's a kind of, there's an overarching theme to it, right? And it's something certainly that's identifiable to that artist where they made a statement. And so you're studying this, but in contrast to that, you know nothing. You know nothing about how to make these things or what you, what you want to say or mm -hmm. even you know, which direction you want to go with that. And I think that's a, a, a tough place, you know, for kind of young artist students to be in. Well, did you feel like that was like you were up for the task? Was that did that feel mind expanding to you to start to get under the hood and tinker around with why you were compelled to make things and define mm -hmm. your why? You know, a lot of the sort of younger artist types that would go to that school 
would be somebody that you know you look at and like you can kind of peg them as an artist like they have purple hair or there's like they have lots of tattoos and like whatever they their outward persona is very evocative of that idea of being an artist and kind of living an artist lifestyle and I was kind of like the opposite of that you know I just had Mm -hmm. like same stuff that I was into in high school I listened to like a lot of hip-hop and I didn't feel really part of that and I still to a degree don't really feel part of you know what you'd call like the art world that is this kind of confined um, or defined thing I mean, does it make you feel like an outsider or does it make you feel like you have a broader perspective? I don't feel like an outsider because I feel like much more normal, actually, than a lot of (laughs) businesses, you know? Um, I feel like the ideas and things that I want to engage with are much more everyday. They're much Mm. more, in some ways, they're much more accessible and certainly can be a criticism of, of a lot of my work is that it is much more egalitarian. It's much more wide, you know? You could say it reaches like a lower level of entrance, right, for people because there are things in it that they already may Mm. uh, recognize. Familiarity is a really great access point, I think. After college, you toured with the Merce Cunningham Dance Company as their stage designer. That sounds like probably a pretty important chapter in your life. Yeah, there's a couple of missing years in there. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, but basically after school, I had sort of become friends with a group of artists in Miami. This was around 1999 to kind of 2003, who at the time, Art Basel, you know, just this giant art fair was just opening in Miami. So there was a lot of attention from international gallerists and museum curators on artists in Miami. And this was the time that I was still connected to the city. So I'd be there, you know, in the summer, but I wasn't really part of that scene, even though I wanted to be, because I wanted the attention of those curators and collectors. And there was a period during school where I actually thought about taking a year off and going back to Miami and sort of being part of that. I didn't, but after school, I moved back to Miami for a period and ran uh, an artist-run space with a number of people there called The House, which was uh, literally like a gutted, typical Miami-style uh, architecture that we had a gallery in. We showed work of our friends and ourselves and was really the place that myself and a number of artists from that group first showed our work, I wouldn't say professionally, but in a context outside of school okay, and, and got recognized by dealers and uh, different people like that. That feels very, well, it feels very DIY in that punk sensibility where you figure out how to do it on your own. But then it also, it feels like kind of uncompromising in your desire to just Mm -hmm. show your work without outside influence telling you what it should be or how it should be shown. I would say it could have been like using your term punk in its sensibility, in the ethos of trying to do something that was kind of outside of the norm. But mm-hmm. in its appearance, in its appearance, it was very much like white cube, typical art gallery. And we did everything that we could to try to make it look like the places that we saw the art that we uh, wanted to show or the places that we wanted to show our work. We made it look like that. You're not trying to destroy the system. You're you're trying to be a part of the system by saying we understand your language. Exactly. And, and yeah. we can do it too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So what, I mean, what, what did that chapter mean for you outside of school? I mean, school is a real fertile time for growth. And then after school is the time where you get to take what you learned and see how it, mm-hmm. you can apply it to the real world and make a living doing that. Did, did that chapter give you confidence? Did it, it was a great period because I was surrounded by, you know, other artists who were not making a lot of money, but at least like living off of this and trying to figure out a path forward. And instead of waiting for other people to come around and invent that for us, we, you know, we kind of created it and we met a lot of people through that. So my first museum show at uh, Museum of Contemporary Art in Miami was basically by being recognized through this, the gallerist that I've worked with for the past 18 years, uh, Emmanuel Periton, I met through that initial space and Merce Cunningham, who I then went on to, uh, as you said, work with for a number of years, saw that first museum exhibition and uh, asked if I would be interested to create stage design. 
I don't know how familiar you are with his body of, of work, but he, beginning in the 1950s, sort of redefined what dance performance could be. And there were other sort of modern choreographers who were also kind of reinventing it, uh, like Martha Graham, sort of taking the narrative out of dance. But he went one step further where he separated the choreography, the music, and the visual aspect into three different creators and went further in that those creators wouldn't know what the other one was doing. He did ask me to work on this project with him, but essentially he said, you make whatever you want and bring it to the theater and essentially I'll see you at the premiere. <laughs> so I never saw his, his choreography before the performance. The musician who created the score didn't know what the dance was going to be. So there, there's sort of three separate elements that are brought together, very much based around John Cage's ideas of, of chance and trying to attempt at something that, as he would say, uh, we might not ha have otherwise found had we put our own taste or um, direction into. That's fascinating. How did you enjoy being a part of that kind of experiment, that kind of... Uh kind of culture that celebrates the idea of like, we're not going to define what we hope the outcome to be. We're just going to define some parameters and see what happens. I mean, it's certainly terrifying in the beginning. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, especially it just stresses given... me out thinking about it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he was quite used to it. And by that point, you know, when I met him, I was 24 years old and he was 84 so he had he was at the end of his career. He had done this so many times. And, you know, thinking back on it over the years, I've often wondered what is it that he thought he was going to get out of working with me? Mm -hmm. um, and, and also what the, the level of trust that he would have had to place. You know, I don't think that even at the stage I am now that I could have that I could go to some 24 year old, you know, out of school artist and say, here's this massive budget project that, you know, is going to tour globally that has all these parameters around it and you just do your thing and I'll see you, you know, at the end. And I, I think he, um, over experience and working with a number of different people, you know, he created a kind of framework for that system to work. And certainly, you know, I did my best to fit in with that, but in the beginning, you know, he worked with, Robert Rauschenberg and Warhol and Jasper, like the most famous artists of the 20th century. And as, as a young artist to be placed in that context, that was like one of the few early things that I would just like wake up in the middle of the night, like freaking out about the <laughs> decisions that I had made and like the choice of work even that I had, that I had put on, but it worked out. We did the performance and he never really told me I like what you do or this worked out great, but he kept asking me to come back and work with him. So I figured he must, there must be something about it in it that functions correctly for him. That is an interesting thing to be given that much license and have somebody trust you that much. And at the same time, you don't get the validation afterwards necessarily until they come back and say, would you like to work? Let's work together again. Right. It's up to you to really figure out what you think was really working about it and what worked for you. And that's that's an incredible gift somebody can give you. <laughs> mm, I agree. But I, I really right. like this idea of the experiment and the fact that he was toward the end of his career. You were toward the beginning of your career. And that is all part of the experiment. So, I, I mean, I find that really, really fascinating. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But I do want to move on to an architecture because that's something you're fairly well known for. Um, and mm -hmm. I, I would like to hear the origin story and then kind of how it all came about, what the mission was, what the goal was. In school at Cooper, as I said, I wasn't always hanging out with the artist. And in some ways, I was hanging out with more people from the architecture school, even though I didn't have that ability or desire to sit inside of a kind of precision based practice like that. I, there was things about the way that they think and work that I appreciated and following school, 
this would have been a couple of years later, I think around 2005, I was commissioned for a major project that sits within my kind of uh, architectural uh, intervention pieces, these works that manipulate the surface of walls. And when I'm doing those in museums or galleries, I can often just create them and kind of get away with whatever I want. But when the works enter public space and are in a sense more permanent or exterior, they require you know, a different set of skills to not only execute, but you're talking about bringing on other fabricators and trades that they need to understand how to create these things or fasten them to the building, et cetera. So mm-hmm. I brought on a friend of mine who I'd gone to school with, Alex Mustin, and he was in the architecture school at Cooper and I was in the art school and I basically, you know, hired him to help me transform this project into something that would would work uh, in that architectural language. And we executed that project. And following that, there was a lot of sort of opportunity, I would say, in areas that were closer to architecture than they were to my own work. And I saw, I think both of us saw this opportunity to find a place that was sort of between these two areas of thinking, the creation of space and the creation of artwork. And could we kind of blend those a little bit more? So we started talking about forming this um, practice together. And we had been inspired by kind of a lot of the themes that occupy Lewis Carroll's thinking in terms of finding something within the everyday and turning Mm -hmm. it backwards, right? Being inside of a space that feels familiar, but everything is different. It's kind of turned around and reverse. Oh, like you, the home you grew up in. <laughs> exactly like the home I grew up in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The mirror image of real, of your reality. Yeah. Um, and so um, this Lewis Carroll poem, The Hunting of the Snark, is about a group of these kind of idiot misfits who are searching for the snark, which is a unshaped, unformed uh, entity. They're on a boat, and the only thing that they have to uh, find this is a blank white map. Um, that they're searching. And so something about this idea of the search for the unknowable, the undefined, speaks a lot to what we intended to do. So hence, snarkitecture. Ah, I love that. Thank you for explaining how the name fits into your your mission, your sensibility. Mm. You guys started working together on a public art installation. I mean, tell us about how the snarkitecture grew and your partnership and your collaboration grew. In the beginning, as this kind of young practice, we didn't really know who our clients were going to be. We didn't really, we didn't really know what we could create. And I think early on, we sort of generated work on our own without a client. So we made furniture and we tried to scale our projects in different ways. And eventually we, we started getting commissions for certain things. And a lot of them were, um, I would say, these kind of experiential environments. So things that were sometimes temporary that were not totally functional in a sense. They were spaces that could have a more loose definition of what you would do in them, right? It wasn't a restaurant or a bar or uh, an office. So a lot of our clients, you know, the more work you do in a certain area, you start to get more of them. So we started doing work with different, a lot of fashion brands and things like that that require Um, these kind of temporary environments in which to house ideas. One of our bigger kind of repeat clients is a a brand in New York that I was very friendly with the the founder of this called Kith. And that's in the kind of streetwear sneaker sort of universe. Um, But he's allowed us to create these environments for him that are kind of much more than you need for that, that type of consumer, you know? He's kind of giving them some, these amazing spaces that are very much about defining an experience. So you may not even go there to shop for something specific. You just want to be in there to experience it. So what kind of uh, experience did you create? The first uh, store, for instance, um, when you walk in, when you walked into it, the origin of this kind of obsession with sneakers for all of us started with the Jordan 1 which was uh, released in 1985 and was kind of the origin of kind of sneaker culture. And so Mm -hmm. we made hundreds of uh, white plaster casts of the Jordan and arranged them in this kind of cathedral-like form 
um, on the ceiling of the space. So when you walked in, it was almost this like church to that universe, right? And <laughs> uh-huh. It's something like as soon as you walk in, you're immediately taken by it. And even just the finishes on the surfaces that he used, you know, were or that, that we created for him were much, I would say, like higher end than what you might expect in that kind of store. Things like marble and, you know, stainless steel and more higher end materials. We are going to get into your creative process, and there's a lot to talk about there. But I want to know, like, functionally and practically, how you navigate a life that involves work with snark architecture, your own work as a fine artist, your relationships with galleries and all of these different brands. Like, what does that look for you, and how does the symphony work, and how do you manage it all? Well, I have a great team that helps me, you know, (laughs) manage to not forget about interviews like this so they're they tell me to like go there and do this Uh, and I've structured the space from the beginning snark architecture in my studio were always in the same environment and that served a number of different functions for me the first of which is that I'm only going to one place right so I'm able Mm -hmm. to kind of float around the studio from working in the sculpture space to walking over to the architecture side and thinking about what's happening over there What it also does for the staff that works with us on these projects, for the architecture side, they're seeing the production of physical objects, things that I don't think in a typical uh, architecture practice like that, you would find things like this, right? You wouldn't have things being made like that in the studio. So there's been times where materials and methods that are present in my art studio have been translated into an architectural scale. A good example is the new, we're opening a new space um, actually next week called Snark Park in New York. And a lot of the ethos of making in the art studio is present in the design of that environment. And for the uh, art side, you know, there's a, uh, a level of precision that is required to do multiple projects globally um, at once. So we need to be able to communicate to... Uh, a museum staff in Detroit where we just opened a project or in Shanghai, you know, these are, this is how we want to create this experience for the exhibition. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and the language of, com- of communicating that is through architectural drawings. So really kind of blending those two. I kind of figured out as, as I go along, you know. <laughs> well, that's what artists and designers are so good at is f- figuring out how to construct something that's never been constructed before. Mm. Let's segue into your creative process. You work in a language called Uchronic Aesthetics, or at least I read that from your, <laughs> from your bio. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm fascinated by that. And I wonder if you can tell us and our listeners what you mean by that and why you're driven to explore this manner of expression slash discourse. I mean, I think... A lot of the work that I've made from the beginning of my career has been very, it's its minimal in a way, but it's less than being minimal, it's reductive. So I'm trying to execute something that it's very economical, right? And it's communication. So mm. it's reducing palette, it's using limited materials, it's drawing meaning from the materials on top of the form that those materials are taking in order to kind of uh, draw in every part of the making into the potential meaning of the object or the things that it can evoke. Mm -hmm. There's been a pretty substantial lack of color in a lot of the the work that I've made, which has its own set of um, reasons, initially having to do with, as I said, this attention to material. So when I was making pieces that are integrated into the architecture, the walls are generally white. They're generally made of the same material. Um, this is pretty much true globally anywhere I would show. And so I was manipulating that surface, hence the works were that white. And there's certainly a thousand different shades of, of that white paint, um, which I've cycled through all of them. And then the more recent work that fits into this kind of fictional archeology, span which are, I'm thinking about as objects from our present or, or the recent past, which have been reformed in geological materials. So they they almost look like an archaeological relic from the past, Mm -hmm. but something from our own existence. So it'd be like if you could travel 10,000 years in the future and look at 
uh, your computer or something kind of calcified in crystal or ash. Um, so the creation of that. And that's really where the, the idea of using material as a device for communication. I didn't take a computer and kind of paint it like a Trump Loy effect to make it look decayed or eroded. It's actually made of a material that we have this visceral sense about mm-hmm. and that that material is conveying as much as what it looks like. And there's a there's a familiarity but a nebulousness in terms of where it fits in to your context, which makes you then opens up that channel in the mind to start to wonder right and think. Yeah. I'm really interested in finding out what's going on inside of your brain and how you keep yourself kind of creatively disciplined and and focused, but also kind of where the inspiration sometimes comes from. Do you have a, I guess, a routine? Do you like run five miles a day or do you take walks in the woods or do you just get into the studio and start playing around with the material? How are you getting inspired and how do you keep yourself kind of focused? I mean, I would say generally there's kind of a backlog of ideas. So either myself or my team here, there's never... There's never a moment where there's not something to be working on and many things behind that that I have already said need to get made, right? Where those ideas come from is more difficult for me to pinpoint. After having, you know, I wouldn't say I'm like mid-career, but, you know, I've been showing for probably 15 years now and tracing the origin of some of those ideas is becoming more difficult as they evolve. But I think even going back to just my childhood in Miami and thinking about the relationship between the natural world and the man-made or like architectural world, there's a kind of simple dichotomy there that is present in so much of my work um, today. And my daily routine depends on where I am because I'm also traveling so much, which in the past five or six years has also had a huge influence on the aesthetics in my work, the subject matter, I've drawn in ideas from places that I've seen overseas and even materials that I've found in other places and in kind of integrated them into the practice. But, you know, I just come to the studio every day when I'm in New York and it's always generally busy. <laughs> uh, harder to find time now to just like not have anything to do, which is all. Yeah. Really- I'm going to ask you about that. uh, Well, (laughs) you know what? Airplanes uh, somehow help a lot. So I do a lot of thinking on planes. Oh, that's good. It's it's like forced (laughs) downtime. Yeah. And I can just read or I do a lot of, you know, notes and sketchbooks. And it's, it's really a time that I can actually go back and think concretely about the most recent projects that I've done and, you know, look back through images and, because right after a show, I'm sort of high off the, the energy just, you know, about the opening and everything that's happened. It's difficult to kind of interpret whether I think the outcome was successful, what I could change, you know, for future iterations of it. And I'm um, just working through ideas through in a sketchbook. And with all these ideas swirling around in your brain, but also the things that are happening in the studio and your backlog of ideas, do you have anything that, like, does that stress you out or does it hinder your creativity at all? Like, what kind of obstacles are you confronted with in your everyday work? I mean, for me, it's super exciting. So, you know, sometimes because the work often takes many months, sometimes years to create, when I go away for a week or two for an exhibition, there's usually things that have been poured in molds. And when I get back is when we open them all up. So I'm, it's kind of like a present for me each time I, I come back and there's new things that have been produced. I mean, I think the largest things that we deal with is expectation of, about time. You know, you, you kind of had this idea that like an artist just is in the studio and they make stuff and then every once in a while they, they like do a show, but like, that's just not how it works. The shows are planned and there's just a lot of coordination, there's shipping. And I think the, the organizational level that the team has to function on is especially when we're doing shows, you know, all, all over the world, um, can get quite complex. That's probably the biggest stress I have is like thinking about, whether works are going to be completed in time and 
shipped in time to arrive for an exhibition. Got it. But even then, we've gotten the team has gotten pretty good about planning, so we don't often run into that issue anymore. I can imagine like the team is a, a support structure, almost like bones in a skeleton, and the experimentation is. Well, the inspir- experimentation that you do is a, a constant level of variables. And in order to work with variables all the time, you've got to have some consistency, some sort of backbone to hold things together. Mm-hmm. And I wonder if you can characterize for us, you kind of started when you said when you get back from a trip, you get to release everything from the molds and you get to see what's in there. In a life of constant experimentation, what are the upsides and the downsides? Is it that sort of tension between the variables and the and the knowns? There's definitely a level of experimentation where I'm trying out new things and they might not always work, but I would say there's enough of them, you know, so Mm -hmm. the odds are quite high. If I'm making 10 things that half of them are going to turn out okay. And then I can do a second iteration. And there's also like different time scales that we play with. So there's things that I know we can test out in a couple of weeks. And then there's other things that are going to take six months to a year to like really properly execute and go through the, the steps to, to create them. There's always at any given time something that's failing and something that's succeeding all the time. What does that do to a person? Do, do you adjust to it? Do you think that you're more evolved and phys- like your nervous system can handle more uncertainty? <laughs> well, it's not uncertain because I know half of it's going to be half of it's going to work. Right? Ah, I just yes. balance my I got odds. it now. Oh, so okay. your glass is half full. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. But what about your your personal life? Do you need that consistency and stability in order to balance all of the uncertainty at work? Or are you kind of go with the flow, glasses half full in your personal life as well? I have two young children. And the more I travel, the, the more difficult it becomes to like, you know, maintain that. So pretty early on, after they were born, I sort of limited my schedule so that I was never outside of New York for more than seven days in a row and I'll literally come back for a day or two and then go back out again. But for them and for me too, I feel like I'm seeing them every week and they never, at this point, it's like they don't really notice that I'm away for that long. You know, it's great for them and it kind of keeps me grounded as well. And also being outside of the studio for that long, I think my favorite place in the world is you know, right where I am right now. And if I'm away for too long, I start to not get worried, but I miss like, you know, what's happening here and seeing things. Yeah. I mean, that seems like, like a, a, a struggle that a lot of people can probably relate to. I'm wondering if you're thinking about the future, like how are you planning on navigating that travel and wanting to be with your kids and wanting to be at the studio more often as you as the kids get older, but also as you're, as you grow, um, as an mm-hmm. artist. I mean, the great thing, I think at some point they're still quite young, but at some point they'll be able to start to travel with me. And when I'm in certain places, I'm like, Oh, they would, this would be like amazing for them to see this. And even my son, you know, yesterday it was a snow day in New York. So I brought him to the studio and he just, that's kind of the first time that he's been old enough to really be here and not, <laughs> get into stuff that he shouldn't be, you know, touching or <laughs> right. um, that, that he can, you know, sort of engage with some of the ideas. And, you know, he came here, he made some paintings, he played with some materials, he kind of, you know, got bored and found his own way and looked at stuff. But I think they're grounding certainly in that way. Um, and, you know, the other sort of interesting thing as the studio progresses and sort of becomes not that it, it was ever unprofessional, but becomes more professionalized in a way of thinking with larger institutions, you know, we're planning sometimes more than two years out. That's another odd thing about being an artist in this way is so much of my life is thinking about things that are happening two years from now. And then you arrive there and it's this weird sense of like, oh, I remember back two years ago when I was thinking about this project that was going to be, you know, it felt so far away and now we're here. 
Uh, so it <laughs> kind of collapses time in a, in a strange Well, kids strange will do way. that to you, too. <laughs> yeah. Your whole growth trajectory, if you think of yourself as, you said, not quite mid-career, but, you know, we all, we all grow and change. It's a constant thing. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering what you would say, what aspect of yourself you would say is in growth mode right now at this particular time of your life? One of the bigger things that I'm trying to think about as, you know, I'm traveling so much is just like being more healthy. And um, I've always sort of made the gym and that sort of part of my, my life, but it gets difficult as I'm traveling so much. And I'm, I think I sort of feel it a little bit more. You know, mm -hmm. I have to land after a you know 15 hour flight and like get off a plane and go give a talk in front of a thousand people and it <laughs> just managing the jet lag and um, being able to stay creative in that sense I think trying to integrate everyday kind of exercise practice um, into my into my life and eating um, and then also trying to stay conscious about the things that I'm that I'm using in in terms of materials you know whether it's within the studio or just out there in the world. When you say stay conscious, you mean you just evaluate them from a larger perspective, use materials that you can feel good about? Uh, mostly to the environment and thinking yeah. about, you know, the impact that that we have on it. And, you know, I think um, having children certainly changes your perspective on the future in a different way than much of my work has. And I I personally feel like the most pressing issue globally, you know, more than poverty or health or anything else has to do with the environment and the kind of potentially very catastrophic things to come. Mm. Um, and just doing whatever I can in my own practice, in my own life to, to affect that. Well, we appreciate that. And speaking of the future, but maybe on a brighter note than potential global <laughs> catastrophe, <laughs> uh, where do you hope to go in your life with your career? Like, what do you hope this all leads to? I mean, in a lot of ways, I've already achieved many of the things that I never thought I would have. If I could go back and like talk to my 18-year-old self and sort of convey where I've gotten to it, it's quite, um, even for me, it feels amazing and, um, very sort of grateful to so many of the other people that have aided me in doing that, but certainly the goals change, right. And the, the, the goalpost moves. So there's larger, um, exhibitions that we're, um, sort of in discussions about, um, thinking about materials like bronze casting that I haven't really, um, executed in my work thinking about works that are, you know, pushing this idea of work that is sort of for everyone and not only residing in the space of galleries or museums into public space, thinking about other mediums that I've sort of touched, but haven't really gone so far into like film. Mm. Um, sometimes when people look at the practice from the outside, there's like so many different mediums and different ideas that go into it. And it all sort of feels the same to me once it's been brought into the, the studio and the kind of ethos of making here that um, it doesn't really feel that different, the work that I'm doing with architecture or like a painting. And the more things that I can bring into that circle and have them feel familiar, it keeps me occupied and excited about creating. Well, we're excited about you creating, too. You have a lot of really great upcoming projects, um, including Snark Park, which you mentioned. Are there any other projects that you have uh, that you'd like our listeners to know about? So I just opened this exhibition in Detroit. It's a really interesting city right now, I think, um, for creators. And certainly Snark Park is opening. I have a large exhibition that's opening in China this summer, in Shanghai, which will be my first museum project in mainland China. And then, you know, upcoming exhibitions, you know, in Australia and... Paris and a number of different cities next year. Very exciting. Very exciting. Yeah, yeah, it sounds like you're going to be on a lot of planes. Yeah. Yes, definitely. <laughs> okay, well, we definitely want our listeners to find those projects and to make sure they keep tabs on you and your work. Where can they find you on the web and social media? I'm in the 
most updated and accurate place is just on my Instagram, Daniel Arsham. The website is updated, but I would say less frequently than, than Instagram, danielarsham.com. Great. And then Snarkitecture is just snarkitecture.com, right? Yep. And okay. Snarkpark, snarkpark.com. All right. Lots of domains. It's awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for talking to us. This has been really illuminating. Thank you. Hey, thanks for listening. To see images of Daniel's work and read the show notes, click the link in the details of this episode on your podcast app or go to cleverpodcast.com where you can also sign up for our newsletter. Subscribe to Clever on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you would please do us a favor and rate and review, it really does help a lot. We also love to chat with you online on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You can find us at Clever Podcast. Clever is created, produced, and hosted by us, Amy Devers and Jamie Derringer, also known as 2VDE Media, with editing by Rich Straffolino and music by L1011. Clever is proudly distributed by Design Milk.